All set. Okay, sweet. So um, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here today for our webinar with Dave Chapman and Francis Tickey from The Real Organic Project. Um, my name is Kenna Bell. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Iowa Organic Association. And I really wanna save the majority of the hour here today for Dave and Francis, but I'm just gonna go over a couple of housekeeping things before they get started. Um, so first of all, I have enabled the Q&A box. So please go ahead and enter any questions or comments you may have during the presentation today there. Um, I will be saving the last 10 or so minutes of this webinar um, to field those off to Dave and Francis so they can answer for you. And they are also able to view that Q&A. So um, during the more conversational part of their presentation, they may answer a few then as well. Um, and then also I am recording this webinar today and I will be posting it on our IOA YouTube page. So definitely check that out for continued viewing and sharing if you'd like. And then I'm also gonna send that to each of you along with a short survey later this evening. Um, so that's another great opportunity for you to um, provide any questions or comments or feedback. And it's really helpful for us as we continue planning our education and outreach programming. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to share a brief bit of background about what we do here at the IOA. Um, for any of you who might be new, so I'm going to share my screen. See. Um, so oh, we are a nonprofit organization that was founded in 2006, and we have a statewide presence. So our members are a diverse community of farmers, gardeners, food farm businesses, advocates, researchers, and consumers that champion organic production and products. And our mission is to advance organic agriculture and food systems in Iowa. And we hold values such as prioritizing ecosystem integrity, community and collaboration, and economic vitality. And we have many priorities and programs. So of course, education and training. So we're doing this winter webinar series, but we also do college visits, field days, technical workshops, and we have many additional resources that we provide both online and in print. Um, and then we're also able to provide technical support and resources all across the state. So a big part of this right now is um, the Transition to Organic Partnership Program, which I'll explain in a little more detail in the next slide. Um, and then we also conduct outreach. So we travel all across the state. And this also includes our social media, our website, e-news, and other online presence. So we have a wide variety of ways that we connect with Iowa's organic community. Um, we also communicate with our policy leaders about organic and about the benefits of supporting and providing policies and other resources for the organic community. And then, of course, growing the organic community in Iowa to provide support for each other and help grow this overall movement in our state today. And so, as I mentioned um, previously, a big part of our technical support and outreach programming um, has been made possible through our partnership with the TOP program. So we're really grateful for that um, because it allows us to provide even more resources to the organic community. And we're especially excited about our new organic farm advisor, Susanna. Um, she's leading our organic mentorship program and she'll also be involved with some of the field days, um, technical workshopping and other outreach events. Um, so definitely reach out to Susanna if you're interested in being either a mentor or a mentee. It's a really awesome opportunity. And then I also wanted to make sure to mention um, the NRCS Organic Management Standard, um, OMS 823. So if you haven't heard about it, basically it provides conservation pro uh, contracts for producers who are either in transition to organic or for those who are already certified. Um, so you can apply for this at your county NRCS office and transitioning producers have a deadline of March 1st for those applications and already certified producers have a deadline of April 5th. Um, so I mentioned that because it was recently extended from March 22nd for certified organic. Um, and basically these contracts provide payments that range all the way from $200 an acre um, for simple row crop operations, all the way up to um, $1,500 an acre. And we have a bunch more information about that on our website as well. So if you need additional assistance um, about the OMS 823 application 
or if you're interested in being a mentor or a mentee, um, please reach out to Susanna or myself and check out our website, um, which is listed here. And I'll also send it out later today with that follow-up as well. So that's just a brief overview of what we do at the IOA um, and some of the resources that we can provide. But like I said, I really want to make sure to save the majority of this hour today for Dave and Francis. So again, we're very grateful to have them with us today. Um, they're visionary founders of the Real Organic Project, and they're going to talk a little bit about the history of the ROP, um, what ROP certification looks like, and then a little bit more about their current work in the organic industry as it continues to evolve and expand today. So um, yeah, without further ado, I will turn it over to Dave and Francis. Thank you, Kenna. Uh... And thanks everybody for showing up. Um, it's it's always a privilege for me to speak with Francis. We're doing it again next month at, at Marvel Seed. Um, this one's easier because I don't have to leave home. So uh, can I ask maybe if I would make a, a short slideshow? I don't quite know the meaning of short, but I did I did make up something just to give a little bit of historical perspective. And then and then we'll turn it over to Francis and then we'll have a conversation. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, we'll see how this works. All right, there we go. Close down participants. There we go. Oops. So I'm almost there. Okay. Um, not quite sure how to get rid of that thing at the top, but we won't worry about it. So Real Organic Project um, began because we felt that that the National Organic Program was stumbling seriously to the point of falling down. And I, I don't mean to suggest that that the National Organic Program isn't is going to stop existing. It's not. And organic is going to continue to grow dramatically in the marketplace because it is, at the moment, the only meaningful alternative to the chemical agriculture system. Uh, we can talk about regenerative later. It's not actually an alternative at the moment, but but we'll talk about that. But certainly organic has grown. It's it's over $60 billion in, in annual sales. And um, the only thing that's growing faster than that is organic in the EU, which is a little bit ahead of the U.S. organic market now. And I, I mentioned that because they've done that without any compromise, um, which which there's been so much compromise. There we go. Uh, there's been so much compromise in the U.S. So this is a real organic uh, poultry operation in Texas, um, Coyote Creek Farm. And this is what, when people go to the store and buy organic eggs, this is pretty much what they imagine that they're getting. And, um, but USDA Organic has changed that. So this is actually what they're mostly getting. They're getting eggs from a facility like this. I believe this is a, a Herbrooks facility in Michigan. And Washington Post said this single facility was producing one out of 10 eggs certified as organic sold in America. So 10% from this one facility. You can see that there's a distinct lack of chickens outside. And uh, no chickens ever go outside in this facility. And even if they opened up a little door on the side, they still wouldn't go outside. This is a two-story facility. It, it, it's, it's a total confinement CAFO. And it is, at this point, uh, definitely over 70% of the certified organic eggs in the country are coming from facilities like this. That's according to the head of the National Organic Program. Uh, well, there's a picture of Francis. So this is what we think organic dairy is. And, and there's a reality, as there was a reality for chickens. This is, this is the reality of a, a wonderful farm, Radiance Dairy in Fairfield, Iowa. And that's what people think they're getting when they go to the store and they buy organic. And this is what more likely they're getting. Uh, certainly over 50% of the milk sold as organic in the country comes from facilities like this. And um, this is, I think this is from Colorado. It's one of the Aurora facilities. This picture was taken from the Washington Post. They did a major expose on this. And so the word, word is getting out 
And the, the bad part of that is it destroys people's faith in organic because this isn't organic. Nobody means this when they say, I want organic, I want to buy organic, I want to be an organic farmer. This is a, a marketing strategy. This is what we think of as a real organic farm. Again, this is a real farm. This is Butterworks Farm in Vermont. And, um, and, but this is more like the reality. And this, this is from USA Today. I'm going to read six organic dairy farms in Texas. This is one of the six. Produced 481 million pounds of milk in 2016, about 23% more than all of Wisconsin's 453 organic dairy farms combined. And, and those numbers came from the USDA. So again, you can see a whole bunch of cows clustered in confinement. You can't see any pasture, let alone see any cows on it. And, and this, is, this is the reality. I, I just want to say one thing before we go on. This, the, the, the impact of this isn't just that some people are being misled. The impact of this is that farms like this are being put out of business because those large industrial confinement operations depress the price of organic milk. And people think, well, I can get a gallon of milk for X. What's wrong with these people? They must be very inefficient. They're not. They're very inefficient. They're very good farmers. It's just that this farm is producing a whole lot of costs that are not being acknowledged at the cash register. In 2014, the NOP issued a statement, I'm sorry, National Organic Program issued a statement that the hydro, that hydroponic production is now allowed in organic. This is the first time that that was ever made official. And it wasn't actually a rule that was passed. It was just a statement that was made. There is no rule allowing hydroponic. And this statement was the first time that the NOP, National Organic Program, ever acted in opposition to a National Organic Standards Board recommendation. They simply completely opposed the recommendation that was passed in 2010. And why? And why are we losing control of the National Organic Program? This is a real organic blueberry operation, right? Beautiful in Florida, so well done. They grow their fertility, they mow and blow onto the plants. And, and that is the whole basis of their fertility. They have some of the best tasting blueberries in the world. They're, they're phenomenal. And we got some top chefs who will swear to it. This is a certified organic production facility of Driscoll's in California. And this picture came from the USDA task force report, which I was on that USDA hydroponic task force to study this issue. And this was submitted by Driscoll's. Um, I, I believe that this is actually a nursery, that these plants will get more widely spaced when they're in production, I believe. But this is what it looks like, black plastic. The plants are growing in pots. The pots are filled with shredded coconut husks. And all of the nutrition is provided as a liquid feed. Again, this is what real organic looks like. This is what people think they're buying when they go to the store and say, great, now I can get organic blueberries all the time. Isn't this marvelous? But this is actually where they're coming from. This is a certified organic blueberry operation in California that I toured. This happens to be my farm. This is, this is a greenhouse operation. And we have a couple acres of tomatoes growing in the soil in the greenhouse. And this is a hydroponic one. I, I got to know one of the owners of this in the battles around, around uh, the allowance of hydroponics. This is from Wholesome Harvest. And I honestly don't know. They have a facility in Texas and they have a big, bigger one in Mexico. I'm not sure which one that comes from. This is what the ground looks like. This is what, this is what the roots are getting their nutrition from at, at our place. And this is what Wholesome Harvest looks like in one of their own pictures. And it's sort of staggering when you look at it, um, the amount of plastic, you, you see every plant's got its IV tube and um, it's, it's kind of unreal. Certainly nobody who goes to the store and says, I wanna, I, I wanna buy an organic tomato, they don't think this is what they're getting. But at this point, it is more likely what they are getting um, the last number I saw from USDA, I think it was, was over 60% of the tomatoes 
uh, peppers and greens are now coming from a hydroponic facility that are certified as organic. Not, not organic, but certified as organic. All right. Uh, these are not evil people. They're perfectly nice people. But we have profoundly different beliefs in what organic means. And I would say that theirs is a tiny, tiny fraction of the world opinion of what organic means. And it's a definition entirely designed to suit their business plan. I got one more like picture of the industry. And um, this is, this is um, a quotation from David Furman, who is the marketing director of Nature Sweet Tomatoes, big hydroponic operation. They have a Bright House is the name of their organic line. And uh, he said this at a National Organic Standards Board meeting. The words yesterday, soul of organic, he was quoting me, were used. And I also thought about some words from November of 2006, where they talked about the magic of the soil. I think he was quoting me again. And I think about that language really as kind of fluff. He was saying, this is just marketing fluff. There's nothing real behind magic of the soil or the soul of organic, but there is. And actually, I would say, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. I don't think he knows that what he's saying isn't true. This is someone with no history in organic. He was just the marketing manager of a large hydroponic company. He's never read Albert Howard or Eve Balfour or any of the many books that have created the um, organic uh, movement. So the question is, is this going to be the future of USDA organic? And this is a certified organic facility in Florida. You can't make this stuff up, right? And I just, this is an old picture. This is Debbie Stabenow and, and Pat Roberts. Um, they were the two uh, leading senators on the, on the uh, Senate Ag Committee. And um, they both decided, Pat always hated organic, but he's decided organic isn't so bad anymore because his home state, Kansas, was home to Cal, uh, Cal Maine organic eggs. So he realized that properly defined organic could be a good thing. Debbie Stabenow's home state has Herbrook's certified organic eggs. And she also became a champion of this kind of new organic. In response to that, we started a movement called Keep the Soil and Organic. And, you know, it was pretty informal, pretty, pretty wacky. And uh, we did get some support. This was Pat Leahy, who was the co-sponsor of the Organic Food Production Act. And Vanda Nashiva in Vermont also holding up our T-shirt. We started to get some buzz. We started to get some significant, uh, well-known people signing our petitions. And we started to have rallies. This was our first rally. And it went on this year, 2017. I think we had 17 rallies that year around the country, even around the world. We had one down in Central America. And the final one was in Jacksonville, Florida. And I'll let Francis tell you about that if he chooses to. But there was a big vote there trying to stop this from happening. And, and the dramatic thing is that we lost the vote. In 2010, 14 to 1, I think, they voted to prohibit hydroponics being certified as organic. In 2017, we couldn't even get a majority. What happened in seven years that suddenly organic meant something totally different? So this, this march had, I just love this picture. That's Fred Kirshenman on the left, and, and who uh, is probably well known to many of the people on this, uh, one of the pioneers of organic farming. And that's Lindley Dixon in the middle, uh, and she's my co-director. So, and these are all kind of significant pictures, people in this picture. This was our Lieutenant Governor, David Zuckerman saying, organic without soil is like democracy without people. And I would suggest that we are facing both challenges right now. Peter Welsh, who was then a Congressman, is now a Senator, came and spoke at our rally. Patrick Leahy, let organic be organic, be organic. And even with the support of Patrick, and he wrote letters to Vilsack to support us, we didn't move the needle an inch. I'm going to read this one, Shelley Pingree. There are more than 1,200 lobbyists on the Hill that work for the agriculture and food processing industry. They spend about $350 million a year on forming opinions in Washington 
and that's more than the defense industry. Don't underestimate their power. And I would suggest that this is why we are losing organic and why we are, in a sense, losing democracy. Certainly in this one corner of the room, we are. Because we, the American eaters and the American farmers, don't believe that that stuff is organic. So my final slide is we are not arsonists, we are firefighters. And it's really important to say this. Um, it's Cornell West, uh, uh, you know, running for president now. And, and he's a, a spectacular speaker. But this statement really, to me, is so true of the Real Organic Project. We did not come to bury organic. We came to save it. Um, all right, Francis. Okay, I just like this. As the Real Organic Project succeeds, either the NOP, National Organic Program, will reform itself, making the Real Organic Project irrelevant, or the NOP won't reform itself, making the National Organic Program irrelevant. We are facing challenges that are too big for only local responses. We have got to get together. And organic is a world movement. It's got several million farmers who are certified with organic. It's got many, many millions of eaters. And what happens in this country is very important in that. We are the second biggest market in the world and the single biggest country market in the world. And we got to do something about it. I'm going to skip this. I'll just say that the, the rest of the world is doing something. In Denmark, they've, they've dedicated amount of money that it, on the U.S. economy would be over $9 billion to support organic and they are talking about real organic. So this is just a quick list of what we do and what you can do. Get certified if you're a farm. Visit our website, realorganicproject.org. Read our weekly letters. God, we put one out every week and about 8,000 people read them. It's amazing. Watch or listen to our weekly podcast. You can find them on the website. They're on any podcast platform, or you can watch them on YouTube. The interviews are done in, you know, recorded that way. Come to our annual conference, which right now is at Churchtown Dairy in October. Come to our annual symposium, which will be in late March. It's virtual. Go ask your local store about Real Organic. They won't know, but you keep asking, they'll find out. Ask your farmer about Real Organic. If they qualify, please have them come get certified. And I will say that there are farmers who support us who are not, do not qualify, and they still support what we do, uh, very much so. Some of them are not certified organic at all, but they're really organic. So we, our movement far exceeds just this label. That's not the point. It's not just a marketing brand. Uh, we need donations because uh, certification is free for 1,100 farms now, and um, we do that because people like you make donations so the farmers don't have to pay for that. And talk to your friends and family about Real Organic. We can only do this together. So finally, I just want to show these two pictures to launch Francis. This is Francis and six of his brothers and sisters on the National Organic Standards Board. In that meeting in Jacksonville, this these six people stood up for us and the other seven did not. And honestly, their reasoning, which they gave publicly at the meeting, was embarrassing, if not mystifying. Their, their reasons for why they supported hydroponic were all over the charts, and they were crazy talk. Um, and finally, Francis organized a letter uh, where I think, well, we get 43 former members, I think, of the National Organic Standards Board signed a letter to Secretary Vilsack saying, we're losing it. We're losing it on your watch. You got to do something. And we had a virtual meeting with him. It was the height of COVID. And um, someone pointed out to me when I showed them this, it might have been, it might have been um, you, Kenna, that nobody looks very happy in this picture. <laughs> so, and nobody was. Okay. So there we go. I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, and I'm going to be quiet and let, let Francis take over. Thank you, Dave. I don't know what I can say. You've really covered it. I just want to tell everybody that Dave is amazing. He he's just does all this stuff and he runs a farm on top of it. I don't know how he does it. 
Um, I'll, I'll refer to a few things he talked about. Um, I was on the National Organic Standards Board. My last meeting was in Jacksonville. He mentioned 2017 in the fall when we tried to readdress the organic, I mean, the hydroponic issue. And it was very frustrating. We had, I think, over 60 organic farmers came from all over the country to talk and to, te to testify that we need to make, um, make organic grow in the soil. And it was frustrating because we had a 15 member organic standards board and many of them didn't really have a background in organic and they somehow they, there's a lot of lobbying too, by the way, uh, of the members of the standards board. And so they, they just got convinced that hydroponic was the future. And it was like talking to a wall. And like, like Dave said, the reasons they gave for voting for hydroponics was didn't make a lot of sense. They were all over the board. So that was very frustrating. And, and one thing I want to point out about that is that the difference between the real organic project and the national organic um, program is that we have the NOSB in the national program. It's 15 members that are appointed by the Secretary of Agriculture. Four of those members, um, according to the originating uh, legislation, were supposed to be farmers, organic certified organic farmers. Well, over the years, Secretaries of Agriculture appointed agribusiness people in the seats for the organic farmers. And of course, we complained a lot. So what happened to resolve that was in 2015 Farm Bill, the industry lobbied Congress and they got a change. So now you can put legally put uh, agribusiness members in the farmer seats. And so you can see the problem here we have is that we as an organic community have no control over the future of the product of, of, of the organic program. Now compare that to the um, Real Organic Project. We have a 15 member standards board also. About 10 of them are organic farmers. And we we um, we have a five year um, term and we, we nominate within our, 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 our own organization. We, we nominate new members and we vote on new members. So it's not from agribusiness or from USDA. So it's pretty frustrating um, the way it was going. And, and um, I, I was at first, when the Real Organic Project started, I, I told Dave, you know, maybe we can just embarrass USDA and they'll change. And, and Dave laughed at me. And <laughs> now I can see as time goes on, they have tremendous lobbying power in the agribusiness and, and they lobby Congress, they lobby USDA, they have a back door in there and they get their, their work done. And, and so we, we can't compete with that. But we still need the National Organic Standard or National Organic Program because that does some basic work on on materials that are allowed. They do a pretty good job. Sometimes they get lobbied to not do that right either. But um, the Real Organic Project certification is really pretty simple. If you aren't, if you're growing in soil and you don't have CAFOs on your farm and you're doing a good job of managing your soils, you mostly can get in. Um, and we encourage you all. And many organic farmers don't really get a benefit um, financially from being members, being certified by ROP, because they may be selling to um, Organic Valley or some other organization, and so they don't have the label. We, in our case, we have our own label, so we use the Real Organic Project label. But many organic farmers, they're doing it, they're supporting us just because we need to get the word out. We need to get um, our label out in the store as, as best we can. Um, there are a lot of things you could say, but Dave, you got any other points you want you want to make? Um, Francis, you talked just just a minute about that letter to Vilsack from the NOSB. Oh. I thought it was pretty amazing that forty three former members, that's the large majority of the living former members, signed a letter saying we're losing the meaning of organic. We really need you to fix it. And uh, and these are like all hard radicals here. A lot of these people no. were, very, were very conservative when they were on the NOSB, but they can see, especially in retrospect, that it's not going the way it needs to be, is that it's the intent of original pioneer organic farmers is being lost. And that's why the Real Organic Project is critical. And I think it's gonna be needed indefinitely. How long? As long as we want real organic food we're gonna need the Real Organic Project because agribusiness is not gonna change their tune and they're gonna do their best to derail things. <clears throat> one, one interesting um, takeoff on what Dave was saying about hydroponics is that it's interesting that in Europe, hydroponics is not allowed. 
but in some countries like Netherlands, they will grow hydroponic food, tomatoes and peppers and such, and they can't sell it organic in in Holland, but they can export it to the U.S. and they can sell it as hydro as organic in the U.S. Pretty ironic that they can't sell it there, but they can sell it here. And think. at the at the moment, Francis, somebody in the U.S. who was hydroponic and got certified legally could export it to Europe, but I suspect that law is going to get changed, the trade agreement. At the moment, well, well, it's reciprocity. You can't sell it to Canada. Canada won't allow it, but the EU didn't negotiate on that because I don't think they even knew it was happening. But the next time that comes up, we'll see what happens. But the point being, the U.S. is the only country I know of in the world that formally allows hydroponic to be sold as organic. And we are the pirates, right? This is the pirate ship. Pirate, it's not a pirate ship, but the ship has been taken over by pirates. And, and you know, we genuinely are losing control of our own small ship, which we hope to grow to be a big ship. But we can't do that if it doesn't have integrity. It's it's not going to flourish, not, not what we care about. And that's why this is important. Um, somebody has a question about uh, conventional agriculture using co-opting terms like regenerative and sustainable, while they still apply a lot of toxic chemicals. And that's a real problem. I know it really gets under, <laughs> it gets on Dave's nerves, but me too. But um, the thing is that we have a big move now for the big organizations, agribusiness, to to label certain agriculture as regenerative. And it usually uses Roundup. And it does, it's mostly business as usual. But now they want to put it on their Wheaties and their Cheerios boxes that were regenerative. And that's really, you got to watch out for it because that's going to be an increasing problem. And as a matter of fact, it was exacer exacerbated when in the last farm bill, USDA put out several billion dollars for climate smart agriculture and regenerative. And a lot of that money was taken up by ADM, the Iowa Soybean Association and other organizations that will do their best to try to do a little bit, maybe maybe no-till with Roundup or just a little bit, but mostly relabel business as usual as regenerative and climate smart. I I'd like to speak to that because I, I think that this I'm sure is you a, would I'm sure you would, Dave. Go ahead. <laughs> well, it's a big problem and it's a it's a complicated problem. It's just the way it's complicated for us to speak up about the problems with organic. And you know, when I interviewed Michael Pollan, I got to interview Michael twice. What an interesting human being. And he said, you know, if you say what you're saying out loud in public, it will undermine trust in the organic brand. But if you don't do it, we will lose organic. So we have to kind of take the hit and tell the truth and say, look, you know, they're not with us. And how do we develop that? How, you know, we don't have the political power. We don't have a lot of things. We're just a group of farmers. We're not just a group of farmers, we're a group of farmers and eaters. Right, because the farmers cannot do this alone, will not succeed. But together, we built a movement once. We can we can rebuild that movement, and we should. But this thing of corporations coming in and saying I'm with them, right? And and the 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 most famous example of it was when the oil companies came into the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, and they wanted a seat at the table. These were the oil companies who are the major players in creating the climate crisis. And they were given a seat at the table, but it was like inviting Godzilla to dinner. And, you know, what are we having for dinner? Well, whatever Godzilla wants, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's just how it is. And, and, you know, there was a hope that things would get better because of that. But I've seen people like Al Gore said, no, we, we set the climate movement back by a generation by allowing them to have a seat at the table. And it's not that no oil company has ever, you know, they've made little, little movements in the right direction, but they've made huge movements in the wrong direction at the same time. So the fear with the regenerative movement, which was started, well, started by Bob Rodale, but, but it got taken up 
by you know midwestern farmers like gabe brown and ray archuleta these are people who really are trying to change agriculture for the better and they have my respect and and i hope that they succeed and they're talking to a group of farmers that they believe would never embrace the word organic i don't agree with that i think if organic had a clear path towards profitability for struggling farmers they would embrace it they'd get over their their judgment that this is just for the left coast and the right coast i think that they'd go no we can make a living this way and they would discover as bob quinn did when he moved there for economic reasons this is actually the right way to farm it works it's better and bonus points as john tester said is i don't get sick when i'm spraying all the all the herbicides that I had to spray before. So I just want to say regenerative as a movement, as it began, wasn't intended as a marketing label. It was intended as a way of conv convincing farmers to farm better, to, to pay more attention to the organic matter in their soil. Conventional farmers, that was who it was aimed at. And we shouldn't revile that impulse or that movement, but I'm waiting for those pioneers to get up and say, I just want to make clear, I'm not with them. I'm not with Bear Monsanto. I'm not with ADM. I'm not with Cargill. I'm not with General Mills. These people are taking this term and twisting it just as has been done with organic, but it's worse with regenerative because there's no legal definition and the chemical companies go, great. Syngenta loves regenerative. We can fit in here. We can use this. Go to Syngenta's website and look up regenerative. It's beautiful. It makes you weep. It's so good. It's so beautiful. It's It sounds like pure organic until the last paragraph. And of course, we will, you know, allow the responsible use of, of herbicides and pesticides and chemical fertilizers. Okay. Well, then let's just be clear about what it is that they're talking about. So the term regenerative means whatever you want it to mean. And some people want it to mean something really good. And so we shouldn't revile those people. But we also have to acknowledge that some people just want it to be a, a pathway to appealing to the hearts and souls of people who want to see agriculture do a better job. And they don't necessarily want to change how agriculture happens. Okay, very long answer. I hope that helped, Billy. I can go ahead and start fielding some more questions if you'd like. We're getting some really good ones here. Is that okay with you too? Yeah, you pick it, Kenna. All right, perfect. Um, so Kim just started with a comment. She proudly displays the ROP sign and uses your labels um, on her blueberries at her farm in Iowa just to start a conversation, which is really awesome. Um, and then she followed up. Do you think Vilsack is reacting now with the OMS 823 money? I'm not sure what the 823, I don't know what the 823 is. So money actually, is, Kim. A good opportunity for me to clarify. So that's the um, conservation contract I was talking about in the beginning um, that provides payments um, starting at 200, and it is per acre for simple row crop operations. So it's just one of those. Um, USDA incentives to transition to organic practices. So the question was, um, when you're talking about your your calls and your work with Bill Sack, do you think that's coming out of any of those conversations? I do. That's interesting. It could be. Yes, it's interesting. Um, when we talked to uh, Secretary Vilsack on that Zoom meeting, um, we were, I think Dave would agree, we were very impressed with how much he knew about organic and he knew about the issues. Um, however, he didn't tell us that he has other people talking to him, and we know what that means. And um, we we know that he's going to throw us some crumbs, and this might be a big crumb. I'll have to look into that one. I don't know about it, Kenna, so I'm going to look into that. Um, but but he will throw us some things, but he's not going to abandon his agribusiness people. You know, I, I assume that the 823 is the 300 million for economic, uh, for uh, organic conversion. Fantastic. I, I hope it's well spent. I hope it goes to actually create change. But, um, you know, there's a lot of incubator pro programs going on now and conversion programs. 
and they're wonderful, but a lot of those people get out of them and then fail financially because none of these programs are addressing the basic um, financial equation, which is can a smaller farm, and I would say a real organic farm, uh, although not all real organic farms are small, right? But can a, a, a small real organic farm make it? And even the large farms, we're seeing them starting to really struggle in a financial system that allows things that are not organic to be certified. Hugh Kent, the blueberry grower, we had pictures of his blueberry uh, operation, is eloquent about this. He says, when you, when you allow hydroponic, you don't just allow it, you mandate it because their cost of production is cheaper. Not the true cost, but the, the, at the cash register cost is cheaper. Consequently, if, if Kim is competing with them, you know, Kim's going, I'm guessing direct sales, fantastic. Having conversations, fantastic. That's what we have to do. But it's getting harder and harder for someone like me or Francis or Kim to get on the shelf of, say, a Whole Foods, never mind on the, on the shelf of a Kroger's or an Albertsons or Publix or whatever, you know, that, that the retail market is changing and it's changing very quickly. And it's changing in, in ways that are going to eliminate real organic. They're looking for a year round product that they, you know, it's, it's what Alan Lewis calls, they want to hit the easy button. Say, great, we're going to buy all of our blueberries and all of our berries, conventional and organic from Driscoll's because they always have them and everything's easy. And, you know, one story about that is I was out in um, Mill Valley, California two years ago at a, at a, I went to the Whole Foods and I always love to go in and see what they're selling for produce. And I was sort of stunned. I don't know, Mill Valley, people maybe in Iowa don't know. Mill Valley is like this very affluent, educated, the kind of place that's really pro-organic, right? This is in Northern California, north of San Francisco, and they're very food conscious. And they didn't have any California organic tomatoes. It was the height of tomato season. All they had was hydroponic tomatoes from Mexico certified as organic. And I thought, how can this be, right? And even some fairly, you know, they're called, in California, these would be mid-scale farms, three to 500 acres, right? Is a mid-scale vegetable farm. They weren't there on the shelves and they used to be. Six years earlier, they were on those shelves. They were delivering to those stores. This was before Amazon bought it. So it's getting worse and worse. And what we're seeing is the exclusion of real organic from, from the shelves. And, and we're losing it. So Can I pick up on something. Yeah, Dave go said. for it, Francis. Dave said it's not small. It's not all small, real organic. But we have to look at really the ecology sometimes limits things. For example, Dave showed you a picture of the chickens out there in the pasture. And then he showed you a chicken house, maybe 100,000 chickens in it. Now, those 100,000 chickens, if you had to put them all on pasture, you're going to be limited by size. But it's not because of size, it's because of the way it's being done. The same thing with um, cows. If they're grazing properly, like they're supposed to be doing um, out on pasture, how many cows can you get and get them to milking and back twice a day? Um, if you got a CAFO with 5,000 of them all standing right there, you can have a lot of them quickly. But you put those 5,000 out in pasture, it just isn't going to work. And so it isn't size per se, but it, the ecology does limit size sometimes. Can I throw in one last thing? I never quite got to the punchline because I still oh, worked. But, no, 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 it wasn't you, Francis. It was me. So uh, Michael Pollan said that, the, you know, we're seeing the government is turning towards carrots instead of sticks. In other words, they're giving away a lot of money to try and encourage things. And so they've given a lot of money and, and, and many of our friends have gotten some of this money to, to help, you know, convert people to organic and to encourage marketing of organic. The stick would be to say, we're not going to allow confinement. We're not going to allow uh, hydroponic. And if that was done, just those things, okay, let's add the third one. We're not going to allow fraudulent grain grown either in America or, or in Eastern Europe or Ukraine or anywhere else in the world, just grotesquely, obviously fraudulent. We're not going to allow those things. 
you've just fixed the marketplace. All of a sudden, you're going to get what we had in Vermont in 2016, which is that all the small dairy farms were looking at conversion to organic because it was the place they could make a living. It was the place that got rewarded for the kind of farm and the kind of scale that they were. And without that changing the marketplace, I don't care how much money you put into training and conversion, which is good, is good, but you're still not going to change the realities of the marketplace. And so when somebody gets out of their incubator project, most of them are going to fail. It's not their fault. It's not personal. It's just the marketplace. So if we could just fix the law, and I say this over and over, we would solve the problem. The, uh, you know what? Capitalism would work. Capitalism would then say, well, who can do the best job while following the rules, right? Who can make the best car while following the speed limit? And uh, but that's not what's happening. So until we can fix that, I appreciate the, the the money being spent on this conversion, and it's all good. It's all good, but it doesn't address address the real core problem. I appreciate you both doing that. Um, I think that was really well said, and um, I'm seeing a several different comments and questions here that um, kind of continue that. Um, so I'll ask um, one from Lorana. She's asking if you think consumers are getting fatigued with all of the different signage around different types of organic and non-organic products um, and how we can help navigate that confusion. I got an answer, Francis. <laughs> well, just... Okay. Ahead. So I haven't seen people getting really tired of, of all the different choices they have in craft beer. And yet craft beer has taken over half of the beer market in America in 10 years. It's amazing. And it's because people were both sort of interested in the variation, the diversity of the market, and the beer's better. And they're willing to pay more for it. And so it's become a real boom to local economy, pe people who make beer and they sell it in their community. And, you know, there's some that have gone kind of big like Sam Adams, but most of it still is pretty much craft beer. And, it, and I just put it as an example that we shouldn't say, well, this will never work. You know, people don't care about the quality of their vegetables. They care about the quality of their beer, care about the quality of their wine. I think they do care about the quality of their vegetables. If they had choice, they'd make it. And the problem is we're losing choice unless somebody is resourceful enough, fortunate enough, cares enough to make it to something like a farmer's market or a CSA which are wonderful. That that branch of sane agriculture is growing and growing, but it's still like 1%. And we got to do something about the other 99%. I, I, let, let's encourage everybody to go to a farmer's market. And in places like, you know, in many parts of France, that is where people go, right? And and in, in Denmark, over half of the food is bought at co-ops. How about that? So, you know, it can't... We, we, we can't base what's possible on what we see is happening now. Many changes are possible, and we need to be daring and bold in our imagination and then dedicated in making them realities. Also, I'll throw in one last thing. In Europe, there's lots of add-on labels for organic. Every country's got one or two, right? And their base foundation is much higher than ours. They don't allow hydroponic, right? They've actually excluded a lot of the grain fraud from Eastern Europe. They said, no, anything certified by that person doesn't count as being called organic. And, and they, they uh, you know, outlaw confinement livestock. And then on top of that, people are saying, well, we think it should be even more nuanced. And we're going to offer that to you. And many, many people are choosing that. So I, I agree that it, it, it can be frustrating to go, oh, my God, it's too much to learn. I can't learn all this. But at the same time, if we want to have good food choices, we are going to have to become more educated as eaters, as citizens. And we can't just, you know, expect that that Albertson's going to do it for us because they're not. And certainly the USDA is not going to do it for us. Great answer. Um, I am going to, this is kind of a follow up and I'm going to combine two questions. So I know you've touched on um, various aspects of why 
um, farmers should certify as ROP and while, why that's beneficial for the whole system. Um, but Tom is asking specifically, since he doesn't have any organic livestock, um, only sells organic grain and sells his grain to brokers, um, why for him specifically, he should certify with ROP. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll do it, but you go ahead first, Francis. I like listening to you talk, Dave. Oh, Jesus, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would just start out by saying that we need a certain amount of critical mass. And um, many of the people who are farm are, are certified by ROP, they, they don't get any market benefit. But in the aggregate, we're gaining a certain amount of power. And USDA is, is taking a little bit of note to us. You know, they, they, they'll stray as far as as they can but you know we're kind of pulling a little bit here too and they're, they're taking notice of this so and if you go to the store and eat food you know that's a reason to do it because maybe you don't raise organic eggs or organic milk something that you can label but you'll want to look for it and the more we can gain, gain that critical mass and that power the more it helps us we have 1100 certified farms now that's great that's something to take notice of dave what do you say I, I say that getting certified real organic is, is not ultimately about market access, and it's ultimately about being part of a political movement. Um, when I became organic, there was no market. There was no market. If I went to the farmer's market back then, I was just a kid, and, and I, I labeled my stuff, my little hand-lettered sign, and said, you know, organic. I would just get grief from a lot of customers like, well, isn't everything, all food have organic matter? You know, I, I, you know, it, it, there was no, there was no uh, broad movement of people looking for an alternative to the chemical system. And I think that that's what organic is. Now it's also dancing with becoming um, a branding thing for and look, we all need to make a living, right? Everybody needs to pay their bills and feed themselves and be able to drive a car that works and all of that. I'm I'm not against farmers making a living. I want to make a living too. But um, ultimately, we're going to make a living because people care about organic. And they're going to care about organic because it is what they think it is. And I think that the more that the... I think that most organic farmers in America agree with the standards of the real organic project. They go, yeah, that's, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. And I think that they don't agree with the standards of the USDA. Most of them are fine, but then you get to these like critical things where you get half the milk coming from a confinement CAFO and you get 70, 80% of the eggs coming from confinement CAFOs and you get a lot of the grain. That's just fraud. That's, that's just fraud coming from, you know, the Turkish mob. I think that we need to defend it. We need to fight for it. At Jacksonville, those 60 farmers who came from all over the country to testify to the National Organic Standards Board in, in Jacksonville, you know, uh, Florida, which wasn't exactly party central, and uh, very few of them grew anything that would compete with a hydroponic product. I do. I, gr I grow tomatoes. That's how I discovered this was happening. And I'll say, you know, in Vermont, organic is working. The Vermont organic farmers, all they certify is real organic stuff, is in my opinion. That's why I was like, oh, I was wrong about the USDA getting involved. I thought it was going to really water everything down. I didn't see it. And then I started this, and I started to have be in a national conversation. I went, oh, this isn't good. This isn't good. And then I was like, this is bad. This is getting bad. So I think, Tom, that the reason to do this, even if it doesn't affect your market, and someday it will affect your market, if we succeed. If we fail, it won't, and then it'll just be you and the and the Turkish mob, right? But if, if we succeed, <laughs> it will affect your market, and there will come the day where the broker will care, well, are you certified real organic? That will come. But in the meantime, we're building a movement, just the way when I, when I joined the Vermont Organic Farmers, I didn't join it, we co-founded it, it was, we were starting a movement. Yes, we started a certification and a label, but really it was so that we would get together once a year and share a, a, a bag lunch and talk about what organic meant. And, and we were building that kind of social web. That's how movements work. 
And I think it's very important. And I, I will say I was mistaken when the USDA came in and took over and created the National Organic Program. I stopped going to the meetings and I just stayed on my farm and I worked and I raised my kids. And it was good. It was a good life. But I was wrong. I abandoned one of my other kids, which was organic movement, which I cared about. And I thought, oh, well, it's out of my hands now. And it wasn't. I was wrong. We should have stayed involved. None of this would have happened if we'd really stayed involved. One more thing I'd add, Tom, is that it's free. I mean, where can you get something this important for free? You know, so, so sign up, Tom. I know who you are. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, we just have a couple minutes left and we've got a whole bunch of amazing questions still um, and comments in the Q&A. Um, so I just want to add really quick that um, ROP has an amazing website um, with all of their resources there. Um, some couple people are asking about the cert specific like certification requirements, processes and costs. Um, so feel free to reach out to me. I can connect resources. Um, anything else if you can't find it. Um, but yeah, since you only have a couple minutes left, if there's anything, um, Dave and Francis, that you want to conclude with, I will give that to you instead of choosing for you. I'll turn it over to Dave. Oh, geez, Francis. <laughs> Again? <laughs> um, you know, for me, a lot of this was just realizing that we have a lot more power than we thought. We don't have as much power as I wish we had, but we have a lot more power than I thought. And, our, you know, we, we literally can't be stopped. If we just get together and do what we know is the right thing, it's going to be powerful. And um, and I think we ought to do it. And, and what's more, it's pretty fun. It's not fun to fight. It's not fun to fight with the USDA or or anybody that, you know, Syngenta, that's not my idea of a good time, but it is my good idea, idea of a good time to talk to all of you. And, and if you get involved in this and help organize it and recruit some of your friends, it's, it's a nice thing to do. You know, you, you get to have meaningful conversations about stuff you care about. And as you do it, you, you get better informed. I was interviewed by somebody and I was just amazed. He was writing a book. I'm like, man, you really know a lot about this. How'd you learn? And he said, I listened to all your podcasts. And and I, I was like, wow, you know, there's 150 podcasts. So it's not for, you know, you won't listen to all of them in a hurry, but but they're amazing interviews, many with farmers, many with writers and scientists and chefs and everybody and Francis. Okay. So that, that was just that's one last thing is that you know, this critical mass is important. We don't think we have to have everybody in the country supporting it and knowing about it. I was amazed a few years ago when I learned that only 25% of the population in the colonies supported the revolution. The historian said that. Well, it doesn't take everybody. It takes a, just a, a few, you know, a few of us to do it. That's right. Thank <laughs> you both. Um, yeah, I'm really glad that we could um, all learn a little bit more together today, and I'm really grateful for you both being here and for all of you being here in attendance um, and sharing your questions and comments as well.